I think that what we have to do is to meet our problems at home. If uh, uh, we don't, uh, I think that there are different ways that we can deal with some of our international problems. We are spending $30 billion in uh, Vietnam at the moment, and I think that on a, we're following a policy there that, uh, uh, where I would like to, which I would like to see changed. And uh, so uh, I think that we, uh, that we have major responsibilities to our own people here in the United States. I think we have responsibilities to provide adequate and satisfactory housing for our people. I think we have a responsibility with the private enterprise system to provide that housing and to provide jobs. I think that we can do it. I think that the administration's bill is suggesting the most expensive way of doing it, let me say, with an inadequate return to the private sector, which we won't be successful and won't construct housing in low-income fields. So uh, I, th I think there are many things that we can do. I would like to have them seen, done this year. If we don't do them this year, I would hope that uh, we will start doing them in 1969. Long overdue assault on slum housing could prove disastrous for this nation. In his recent message to the Congress on the plight of the cities, President Johnson called for the construction of six million low and moderate income housing units during the next 10 years to replace the deteriorated dwelling units in which millions of Americans are now doomed to live. Today, I would like to add my voice to these others to reiterate my conviction that swift and massive action is required. Nearly two decades ago, the Congress pledged this nation to the task of providing a decent home for every American family. We have not yet redeemed that pledge, and I believe that we must redeem it now. But the business of this committee is not simply to recognize the need for action. It must make a careful judgment about the kind of action that should be taken if new housing is in fact to be provided. In the past, we have tried many approaches a public housing program to build and maintain low-income housing, the 221D3 programs to subsidize mortgage interest rates, and the rent supplement program to augment individual housing budgets. But these programs, up to the present time, have not proved adequate. 
As of the last housing census in 1969, over 9 million urban housing units were classified as either completely substandard or so deteriorated as to be in need of a major repair or in serious violation of local building codes or badly overcrowded. Yet even these figures do not fully describe the blight which scars the faces of our cities and of our towns. In the midst of our urban poverty areas, over 40% of the housing is dilapidated or physically deteriorated or without adequate sanitary facilities. And when the housing which non-white Americans are left to live in is surveyed, the standards for measuring decay show even more horrifying results. In St. Louis, over 51% of non-white units are unsound. In Pittsburgh, over 58%, and in some areas of Newark, over 74%. Uh, areas where our, some of our migrant farmers live, and of course the housing in some of these rural areas is as bad and in some cases worse than it is in our urban centers. But as I gather, we're focusing attention before this committee about a housing program dealing with uh, the deteriorated housing situation in our urban areas. I think that uh, it's equally important that we provide adequate and satisfactory housing for our rural areas as well. If we are to make a administration in, uh, in uh, great detail, the reservations that I had about the bill, and uh, there were some changes made, in my judgment, uh, there are still inadequacies in the legislation, which I will try to discuss with you today. But prior to my increases, rather than decreases, in the number of non-whites living in substandard housing units. Uh, the description that's been given of this bill is to try to deal with the housing problem in the big cities of the United States, in our urban ghettos. And in fact, there's no requirement in the legislation that any of this housing be, in, re, be constructed uh, in the uh, urban centers or in our ghetto areas. Second S3029 is deficient in its failure to encourage the employment of low-income residents in the rebuilding of the housing in which they will live. And that the people themselves are going to share in it, there's going to be tremendous resentment. And I think that the committee should examine that closely. Third, the absence in S3029 of any provisions to This approach would achieve virtually all of the goals at which S2100 was aimed, and it would do, do so without relying on tax incentives. The program would work as follows. First, it would insulate any low rental project built by private enterprise under S3029 from federal taxes. The building would therefore produce neither taxable income nor tax losses. Its income of 6% and the building itself must be sure that any housing bill that is finally enacted will be effective, that it will keep the promises that it makes. All of the measures that I have discussed are based on the recognition that the energies of all Americans must be brought to bear on our housing crisis. Our job here is to provide the incentives that will make a substantial contribution by private industry possible, and not only possible, but certain. I hope that my comments and suggestions will help us achieve that goal, and I thank the chairman and the members of the committee for permitting me to appear this morning. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Senator Kennedy. You've given us a very uh, thought-provoking statement. Of course, we fellows sitting on this side of the table have some difficulties, you realize, in uh, handling legislation that will provide adequate uh, housing. We have tried through the years to find a solution to these problems and particularly to the very problems that you uh, deal with low and low moderate income families. Well, nobody has done more about this, Mr. Chairman, than you have uh, for a long period of time. Well, I, I thank you. We, we recognize the uh, lack of uh, completeness of the job, but there are some real problems. Now, now you, you spent a lot of your time discussing S2100. Of course, you realize that our hands are tied with reference to S, uh, I mean, with reference to tax incentive. I, uh... Secondly, we're trying to develop a program which will deal with it. In my judgment, uh, this committee has more knowledge about that and has done more in this field than, than any other group. But the answer for the, that I think is, is obvious, and I mean, and I, People have different 
ways of approaching it, but it just seems to me that the area, the direction that we have to move, and which I think is recognized by the, whether it's the Riot Commission or whether recognized also by the Kaiser Committee, recognized by all independent groups that have studied this problem, is that we're going to have to move in the direct in, direction of tax incentive. That we can't have programs that are just run by the federal government in Washington, that we have to bring in the private se sector and the private enterprise system. And I just don't believe that it's going to be possible to just ask the private enterprise system to come in. There's going to be, have to be some profit motivation for them to come in. And the way that that's been done successfully in the past, whether it's oil, whether it's grain bins, whether it's defense plants, whatever it's been, it's through uh, tax incentives. This is the greatest crisis that we're facing here in the United States at the present time. And I would just hope that all of us, no matter what the jurisdiction of any particular committee would be, that all of us could try to develop a program, even if it crosses the lines with other committees, that develop a program which would be the most satisfactory in dealing with the problem. Well, I repeat, I'd like to see a tax incentive uh, try it out. As a matter of fact, we've had tax incentive proposals uh, suggested to this committee many times over the years. I think you have in the, in the past. I can deal with it. I must say that I am wholeheartedly in sympathy with your idea of tax incentives. Uh, we Texans have believed in tax incentives for a long time, dating back to the beginning. <laughs> 27 and a half percent depletion allowed. I wish you could uh, talk to your fellow Texan and get them to switch over to this one. <laughs> And if I we're going to allow it for oil, we should allow it for, for ghettos of course, that provides and, jobs and too, for housing and providing jobs. But we won't and I don't know why either. we continue to support it for people uh, looking for oil well, that's and uh, those who are in grain bins without doing it for the having it involved also in the big, largest I crisis that's facing I endorse, this country. I endorse the principle. If you can convince the Finance Committee, I think we'll... We'll, well if we all work together. Uh, on page three of your testimony, you say we must require that a significant percentage of the working force on each housing project built in an urban poverty area be drawn from the residents of that area. Uh, do you subscribe to the principle of sweat equity as embodied in S-2700 and S-3029? Uh, Can I just see the uh, Well, I think... Uh that we can have something along those lines. I think that uh, one of the problems with it is that uh, many of these people are not going to be trained in order to take on some of these jobs. <coughs> Senator, last, uh, we, we've started a project up in Bedford-Stuyvesant, and we started to bring people in, uh, people living in the area themselves. It's the largest ghetto in the United States. And we started bringing them in, and we were able to work with the labor organizations, and we were able to bring in these unskilled workers as well. I think that it has to be done carefully. I'm not suggesting, as you notice in, my, in the legislation or in my statement, a, the exact percentage and exactly how it should be done. It just seems to me that the committee should examine that well, very that, closely. That leads to my next question, and, I, and really it's, it raises a very interesting question because we're concerned not only... But the point that you make is a very valid one, and, uh, and my judgment why we can't continue as we have in the past. The... Um, survey of the bill, and I might say the most constructive, because you've offered an alternative which is, is uh, constructive and which uh, we, I think we can, in part certainly, begin to accept and begin to work on. So I think this is a most useful uh, morning and, uh, and very, very helpful testimony. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'd also like to commend you on your emphasis on resettlement, which is certainly the great failure of all of our housing programs in the past, and uh, uh, we, we apparently do not provide in this bill a kind of resettlement provisions we ought to suburbs yes. twice as fast yes. as people are. Yes. Uh, Professor Sternlieb of Rutgers testified before us and told us that there's something like, uh, well, that there are more Negroes working outside of the city in every job category, not just service job category, in every job category than whites. Yes. And finally, the Kerner Commission seemed to indicate the, with great emphasis that we ought to, uh, we ought to consider more, more strongly the dispersion of the people living in the ghettos yes. rather than building up the ghettos. And Walter Ruther testified that we don't just want uh, modernized ghettos uh, with, uh, with uh, modern plumbing and so forth. What we want is an opportunity for people to live everywhere. Now, in view of the fact that the bill which uh, Senator Mondale played such a big part uh, on, the open housing provision, has now passed, uh, doesn't it, uh, isn't it logical that maybe our housing legislation should not be designed to concentrate on building these low-income units 
so heavily as you seem to emphasize in the cities? Well, uh, Senator, I agree with everything that you say, and, I, and, and when you say that you disagree with, with me, I, I agree with what the, the, uh, the points that these other individuals have made. Uh, and I agree that it would be fine to disperse the Negroes and non-whites out of Harlem and out of Bedford-Stuyvesant into the suburbs. But the fact is that that's not going to be possible right away. I mean, you're not going to get, uh, I'm just facing it practically, you're not going to be able to move uh, 500 or 100,000 Negroes out of Harlem into Westchester or Nassau oh, or no, Suffolk. The, you can't the move. The jobs are in the suburbs. The jobs are in not, uh, not in the... In the uh, in the very, of course, high Agreed. rent or high cost and suburbs, but in the lower cost I, suburbs. I'm in, it's true around Milwaukee. So why, I'm in favor of making it possible for Negroes to move out of the ghetto and into the suburbs, and to bring their children into the schools, and to find jobs there. And I think we should make a, 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 the greatest possible effort along those lines. I'm 100% in favor of it. But there are going, the ghettos are still going to exist. Those areas of the cities are still going to be there. And if they're not going to just be a, a tax drain on, uh, on the city and on the state and on the federal government, there are, uh, then we, we're going to have to do something there. And I'm not in favor, Senator, of just building new housing there and just putting up new housing there. I'm in favor of providing employment. It's absolutely right there aren't jobs there. It's absolutely correct that they're moved to the suburbs. But the reason that there aren't jobs there is that we've made no effort with a federal program to try to bring jobs there. But you so see I'm in favor of putting jobs, making it available, and make it possible for Negroes to move into the suburbs. I don't think it's a practical possibility to do that immediately. I don't think it's a practical possibility for an untrained Negro or for a Negro who's gone through the educational system in the city of New York, in the city of Los Angeles, or one who's come from uh, Mississippi and now is living in Boston, Massachusetts, to get a job immediately in some of the suburbs and to move into a house and have his children go to the school. Yes, but you, you see, my argument is that the Negroes are working in the suburbs now. They're working outside the city now. And, and if you build, if you, if you build 75% of your new units within the ghetto area, if you're going to uh, uh, attract uh, uh, the jobs as much as you possibly can into the ghetto area, it seems to me you're going to perpetuate something that you want to break up for moral reasons. And, and try and buck an economic trend that's very powerful and very yeah. strong. I think just for, for a long time to come in the future, there's just going to be very, very few Negroes who are going to be in a class that they're going to be able to move out of uh, the, their, the ghettos that they live in now, uh, know what to do, uh, how to find jobs, and get their children entered school. If you, for instance, just looking at the school system, Senator, uh, for a Negro family who has some three or four children and they're going to school, his, his child in a uh, ghetto school now at the age, in the third grade is a year behind. In the sixth grade, he's two years behind. He brings them out into a, a school in a suburb and has a 12-year-old child and it has to go in the third or fourth grade because it can't keep up with the other children. I, my point is I'm in favor of doing that and making a conscientious effort to do that. But at the same time, I don't think that we can permit the complete deterioration of the ghetto, the complete destruction of the ghetto. I think that we can start to rebuild that while we're doing the other, uh, providing housing, providing jobs, providing education for those who can move out. I don't think it's inconsistent. And we go back to the Riot Commission. The Riot Commission said, we need jobs in the ghetto. We need in the ghettos. We need a better educational system in the ghetto. But that's not inconsistent, and I don't mean it to well, be Well, I agree with that. I, I certainly agree that we, I, that we I, should I, uh, work on, on uh, rehabilitation and also rebuilding the, in the, the, greatest in the need ghetto, but I say that not 75% of the houses. That's you, you can examine the figure, uh, Senator, and, uh, and hear other witnesses, and maybe you'll change that. I'm not wedded to that particular figure, but I think we have to recognize the fact that uh, these people are still going to have to remain there, and I think uh, they, and a lot of them don't want to move. A lot of them are... Uh, are not able to move for many, many reasons. It's very, very difficult to move out of Watts, for instance. It's very, very difficult to move out of Watts. Now, despite the legislation which was so ably uh, led through Congress by uh, Senator Hart and Senator Mondale, it's still going to be difficult for, for a man who lives in the ghetto to, uh, to uh, go out and find a house and, and, and buy housing, have an income, and not sufficiently, a sufficient income to move into the suburbs purchase a home, find a job, and send his children to school. It's still going to be difficult for him. And while that process goes on, which I'm in favor of, and which has happened to every other racial group, 
I think that we have to do something about these center areas, the center core areas of the city. That's all I'm saying. I don't think what I'm saying is inconsistent. Well, I think we agree. I, I think we would both agree we want to make it as, as attractive and it's not Cudahy, Wisconsin. I'd be no, talking about Oak me, Creek, Wisconsin. Give me, I'd be talking instance, about the, if New York the suburbs the of, of uh, Milwaukee, and there are about nine or ten of them. And I'm sure that if I knew enough about New York, I could probably start from right. there, where there are uh, uh, low-cost houses and there are jobs and where the Negroes work, where they have to come back into the ghetto at night after they, after they work in the daytime. And, and as I say, I think the Hart-Mondale uh, uh, Brook approach has, has helped us move in that direction. Now, I'd just like to ask uh, one other thing. Uh, it's far, far less expensive than 221D3. It's far, far less expensive than the rent supplements. And it's, it brings a greater yield to the uh, private uh, uh, enterprise system, therefore more attractive and at lower rents in every way possible. It's, uh, it's, it's better for the United States government, it's better for the, uh, for the individual living in the, in the, 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 the individual who is, wishes to rent, and it's, uh, and it's better for the, for the uh, private sector. Are you and saying? All, we appreciate. Our next witness is Senator Joe Tidings. Senator Tidings, if you come around, we'll appreciate. And I, there are some parts of your bill in